Dr. Ali, he's from Springfield. Um, you'll get a chance to hear more from Dr. Ali later on in the program. Um, uh, as I mentioned to Vera, uh, I always want to give a shout out first and foremost to Ian Ford and Tula here. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think we should put that past us. Like, there are people here who are certainly subversive, who are trying to stop what we're doing. And, uh, we should recognize them, even though we may not be able to recognize them physically. To really, really um, do what you can to support the artist here, to support, support Food for Thought. Um, one of the uh, last bastions of, of uh, democracy and activism through intellectuality that exists in Western Massachusetts, so certainly support Food for Thought. Um, I want to start, of course, um, with Mumi Abu Jamal's words um, from Death Blossom. A write-up for writing. On June 3, 1995, one day after being served with a death warrant, I was served with a write-up, a misconduct report for engaging, activity, engaging actively in a business or profession, that is, as a journalist. So strongly does the state object to me writing what you are reading now, what you are now reading, that they have begun to punish me while I'm in the most punitive section that the system allows for daring to speak and write the truth. The institutional offense, my book, Live from Death Row. It paints an uncomplimentary picture of a prison system that calls itself correction, but does little more than corrupt human souls. A system that eats hundreds of millions of dollars a year to torture, maim, and mutilate tens of thousands of men and women. A system that teaches bitterness and hones hatred. Clearly, what the government wants is not just death, but silence. A correct inmate is a silent one. One who speaks, writes, and exposes horror for what it is, is given a misconduct. Is that a correct system? A system of corrections? In this department of state government, the First Amendment is a nullity. It does not apply. Not one, not a cop or, nor a guard, can find one lie in live from death row. Indeed, it is precisely because it's true that it is a target of the state and its minions, a truth they do not want you to see. And I'll skip ahead. As you read this, know that I am being punished by the government for writing live from death row and for writing these very words. Indeed, I've been punished by the United States government for my writing since I was 15 years of age but I've kept on writing. You keep right on reading. Okay. Indeed, conscious that they were engaging in criminal acts, just through writing, just through exposing themselves through culture, exposing themselves through the pen. I was talking to um, one of my students the other day who didn't perform so well on a quiz, and I was telling him uh, that I know this is tough, but keep in mind that people have died just to be in the position you're in. And what I mean by that is, not just to be at a university, but people have been punished simply for writing, simply for learning to write, simply for learning to speak, to forge revolution through the very act of writing as criminals. So I certainly want to pay homage and pay respect to the artists and the writers here today. It really does, at least from my position, start with culture and how culture really infiltrates the mind and allows
calls us to be in this space today, food for thought, being able to open up a space today when really no one else would have, I think, the gumption to engage in this type of fight. So with that being said, I want to bring up our first artist. All right, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, it is Olivia. All right, please give her a round of applause. Can all of you hear me? Okay. Um, first, thank you so much um, for having me. Um, it's truly an honor to be here with all of you conscious folks. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I am the chair uh, this year of Mount Holyoke chapter of the Students Against Mass Incarceration Group. Um, Um, my co-chair, Bridget Greer, um, she couldn't be here tonight, um, but she sends all of her kind thoughts. Um, and without much more delay, um, I am going to do a piece um, called Reune, uh, The Home That I Make. Uh, this piece is, as it sounds, uh, about a homecoming, because um, I believe that that's that's the goal that we strive for in this work, um, a homecoming. We are complements of each other, you and I. I could stand next to you in front of a mirror in an alternate universe and see a me that could only exist by knowing you. Perhaps the future that's written for each of us intertwines forever, perhaps only for a season. But whatever the length of our chapter, I'm better because you raised me, I know you did. Seasoned because of the experiences we share and God do I pray for more to come. They say a friend is an extension of the self and I would gladly tell the world that you are I and me is you. So comrade, spirit ally, friend, let me be so lucky as to step where you have stepped, fall where you have fallen, and stand upright when you make yourself a new. Comrade, spirit ally, friend, let me continue to revel in your presence in my life. Then and only then will I, will you, be fully able to give the world our blessings. And not the world that's made to see us fall simply because we exist, no. Not the world that rejoices in the endlessness of our suffering, no but the world that we will create to share with our siblings that will nourish our one drop too many skin, our God, our rage, our youth, our age, our roots that even Alex Haley would agree would say we could not have been slaves. Blessings. And I'm confident I'll know what a blessing is because I'll have the pleasure of learning from you for as long as the edges of your reach surround this palace that I live in. Mi querida tierra, Eres la canción que canto cuando no tengo palabras para las bendiciones que me has dado. Eres el regalo más precioso que podría recibir después de tantos años de celebraciones. Por fin puedo reunirme con mi refugio cuando la adversidad llega. Finally, my breasts are slower and softer. Finally, I close my eyes one last time y libre soy, and I'm free. En mi querida tierra, and my dear land, not the land of the free that was built on the top of, at the expense of, in spite of my family tree, no. I'm talking about the land that was made for me. So um, as was mentioned, um, I'm doing this PhD thing. So we, 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 tend to, we tend to fall in love with books, not because uh, we simply have to, but for some of us because we want to. And so, um, as we also know, I believe um, today is the National Day Against Police Brutality. And uh, far too many black and brown people um, end up being victims of um, police brutality. And so we're here today fighting that. And um, I was talking to Jewel, um, who was the artist some of these amazing pieces. So just really quick, give him a round of applause because he certainly deserves it. Check out his pieces. I was talking to him about um, what I was gonna say today in uh, this piece by James Baldwin 
believe he wrote it in uh, either 1960 or 1963, uh, Fifth Avenue Uptown, in which he's talking about the police. And I think sometimes what's missing from our analyses of James Baldwin, if some of us remember some of his works, whether it's another country or Gene Bonnie's room, that James Baldwin was a radical brother. Like he was really a radical dude. All right. So I want to read some of the, uh, some of his words um, on this very important day. Similarly, the only way the police, or the only way to police a ghetto, is to be oppressive. None of the police commissioners' men, even with the best will in the world have any way of understanding the lives led by the people they swagger about in twos and threes controlling. Their very presence is an insult. And it would be even if they spent their entire day feeding gumdrops to children. They represent the force of the white world. And that world's real intentions are simply for that world's criminal profit and ease to keep the black man corralled up here in his place, the badge, the gun up in the ho uh, the gun in the holster, and the swat, uh, swinging club make vivid what will happen should his rebellion become overt. Rare indeed is the Harlem citizen, from the most circumspect church member to the most shiftless adolescent, who does not have a long tale tale to tell of police incompetence, injustice, or brutality. I myself have witnessed and endured more endure, endured, excuse me, it more than once. The businessman and the racketeer also have a story, and so do the prostitutes. And this is not perhaps the place to discuss Harlem's very complex attitude towards black policemen, nor the reasons, according to Harlem, that they are all near uh, that that they are nearly all downtown. I had to pause for a moment because it's just incredible how his words are still apropos today. Um, with that being said, uh, I want to invite Vera up here uh, with some of the members of this wonderful campaign. Uh, please give Vera a round of applause. Uh, she did, she led the charge. You, I want folks who have um, participated in our meetings, some new, um, some from when we started um, during the summer. Um, so that means I need to see Joe Markin up here. I need to see Lila up here. I need to see Sheldon Gaynor up here. Um, folks that have attended our courthouse solidarity rallies and vigils. That means Michael Manjo, <laughs> stay up here. <laughs> Lucas Salazarno. Uh, and Julia, you need to come up here. <laughs> Dr. Ali. Thank you. Um, Hill. And uh, where's Gary Tartikoff? <laughs> come on. I, I want everybody to see who makes up the justice for our youth? Um, who's gonna, you know, this is this is the makeup. So this is this is how it happens. And um, am I missing anyone from up there, from down there, or from wherever? Vanessa. Wayne. Yeah. Vanessa. And Wayne. Vanessa. Come on up. <laughs> like, oh, you got me. Both Vanessa's come up, and I know, I hope they can do spoken word, because I don't know their last names, and I apologize. Um, Packy. Packy. Lois Aarons, the Real Cost of Prisons Project. Oh, Stop, come on. I need, everybody, I need everyone here in this space to witness how justice is going to get accomplished, how, who works this campaign. Um, so so this is a part of it. And now, what's even more fantastic, before there was a justice for our youth, there was a justice for Charles. So I want everybody who was a part of the Justice for Charles campaign to come up here, because that was another man that was wrongfully convicted and sent to life in prison without parole. Just turned 30 this summer, but we were able to campaign for him after his 
uh, sentence and, and guilty verdict, and, and the second jury got it right this year on January 17, 2013. Charles Wilhite was able to walk home with his family. <laughs> Joe Morgan's partner to come up here because we all need our family, our friends to support the work that we do, the grinding committee work. Um, I see many of you out there, so I, I just want to applaud applaud everyone here that's standing up here, and also uh, before there was a justice for and Iman, yes, he's been in our living room, um, and before there was a, a justice for Charles, there was a justice for Jason. So many folks up here were involved in the Justice for Jason campaign who, um, a, a student that, uh, Let's go ben. Come, on, ben. come on Ben, come on, <laughs> um, a student that was uh, racially, I mean, it, it, prosecutions are, are racist and uh, so this is another African American man, Jason Vassal, who was uh, charged wrongfully and, and because of the great work of students professors who had the courage to speak up and stand out in, in vigils and rallies um, and protests. Um, Jason Vassal has his, his freedom and he's able to, to be at home and, and live his life. So I just want to say that. But um, I do have Julia Lee is, is 35 years old. I, I, you know, I want to um, reserve this space for the, the true artist here. Um, but he's 35 years old. He's, he's just I'm 39, you know, he grew up in Amherst, so it made sense for us to get involved because he, he grew up with the, uh, the son of our current Amherst chapter, NAACP president, you know, we, we just revived the chapter this year. Um, so it just made sense, he knew so many people in common um, with us and, and also in Springfield, he knew a lot of people in Springfield as well. Um, he operated Nature's Garden, which is an a incense shop right down at the carrot shops over here, went to school at the middle school, the high school here. So he's a local person. Um, his mom is Puerto Rican. His dad is African American, um, African American, who, who has been um, deceased for a while now. But you know, he just basically he he operated this nature's garden also in Springfield, and next to it he operated the Suna Suna Sunai. Um, it's like a community center. And uh, he was basically targeted, and you'll hear more about, you know, from Dr. Ali about how this is done in the community, how the FBI sort of um, just destroys people's lives, even though they're not doing anything, they're just conducting their lives, their lives like you and I. So I'm just going to cut it short right now and give it back to Iman. But we have a Facebook page that everyone should um, find. It's called Justice for Our Youth, and you'll hear later on from our youth. Is, was that a big secret? <laughs> no, no, he's no. All, so 8.30, he's going to call in, so you'll actually hear from him. Um, also, uh, what else is happening? So Facebook page, Justice for Our Youth, please like our page. You'll, you'll read his written statement there as well, and you'll hear and you'll get updates about the court solidarity that we would like for you to participate in. Um, basically, this is a case out of Springfield, so it'll be in Hamden County, so that's 50 State Street right there in downtown Springfield. But anyway, just link, us, link to us, sign up. Um, Lila, and I also want to thank Lila. She's an amazing organizer for this event. So, okay. Am I giving it back to you, or am I? Or just pass it around. Pass it around. Okay. Here. Okay. Here, let me get it passed It's the um, our listserv. And, and yeah, if you want to get connected that way, please sign up your email and your name. Um, for now, Iman, do you want the mic? Or? Not just in the Springfield area but all around the world. I don't know if you got the opportunity to read the report that we made about the National Day Against Police Brutality. Among other things, we started off mentioning that there are things that we need to know. And we know that we need to know a whole lot of things about life and culture and nature. But there are some things that we really do need to know in order to protect ourselves from those people who have been in opposition against us. Now, one of the things that we need to know is to learn a new language. Let it be the language of the brute, of the people in blue, 
or the people that are involved in the police department or the military across the nation. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say that all of them are wrong or bad, because surely we have some respected officers in the department and in the military and in the National Guards and the FBI, whom I would like to speak about brief. But there are so many who are, have no mind of, of, of compassion. Sometimes they seem to have the mentality to kill people. I was listening to the educational show this morning, Democracy Channel on 91.1, and it brought up, among other things, a woman by the name of Cruz, who had called for the emergency to come and get her husband because he wasn't well. So when she called, the police came. Some kind of way, a confrontation got in between her husband and the police. And within the short period of time that they were there, this happened 7.30 this morning on the news that we got the information, the police shot him in the head and killed him. That was Mrs. Cruz. A few days ago, there was a woman who came to visit her son from New Guinea. She heard her son wasn't well. He had locked himself in a room and he wasn't eating and he wasn't taking his medication. Whatever there was for, he wasn't taking it. She got there and saw her son was very disturbed of his health. And she called the emergency to have him to come, or them to come, to see about her son in an emergency. But the emergency didn't come first. The police came. Police told her, well, first there was one, and then there was two that went upstairs. They told her to go down the stairs. So reluctantly, she went downstairs, and then some police officer came. I think there was four more. Within a short period of time, they had put the yellow protected tape around the front of the room on the top floor. She went and wanted to know, why were they doing that? Because she knew that they usually do that in an emergency or a homicide. They had just shot her son in the head because of the fact that he would not communicate with them through the door. He would not come out the room. This came over the news 7.30 this morning. Now, I don't know how many of you may know or may not know about the murder of, uh, what was his name in New York two years ago? The Labio? Abadou. Abadou shot 41 times, going in his pocket to get a key to open up his door by undercover police officers in New York. Now, I know that all police is not like that, or like those that I mentioned, but there's four too many that is causing harm to our people. So what are we doing tonight in relation to the National Day Against Police Brutality? One of the things that we're trying to do is to bring some information out that at least would give you heads up on what they're doing to us. Because I don't know if statistics cover what they're doing in relation to minorities. And there was a time, 1964, that we was under the impression that they was against black people. Oh man, they're against us. White people don't like black people. But El Haj Malik Shabazz came and informed us that it wasn't a skin tone thing. It was more less of a mindset in relation to the government. Now we realize, 47 years later, it was not not just the blacks. It is the whites, it is the minorities, it's the people from Latin America, the Mexicans. They have a design in this society that they want total control. So we have to offset that. That big locomotive that's coming down the track, and it will probably arrive in the future, and I hope that there are some intelligent brothers that are here that will be able to offset it, and you offset it by having knowledge of what they are about. And what they are about is racism, discrimination, 
and oftentimes taken us to the graveyard. I was very interested in a paper that I saw back then. I don't know who put it there, but it's talking about genocide. That is a flash of the future. When people are no longer needed, it appears to me, at least in my art years of living, that they make a way to get rid of them. In the 60s, it was birth control. And then there was the war uh, in Vietnam, and then there was the Afghanistan war, and a lot of these peoples are going on the front line and you never see them again. So I'm saying there is a design, it appears to be, that somebody wants to eliminate us. And I'm not talking about the blacks anymore like in 1964. I'm talking about all of us who are not fitting within their standards. And their standards is about control. As long as you do what they say and jump through their hoops and do whatever they want you to do, then you are okay. But if you start questioning things, because I think one of the most dangerous things in America today is not as it was before, a black man with a gun with hatred in his heart no, no, no. It is a black man who have equipped himself with knowledge about this society. He is very, very dangerous. Why? Because he learned to read and write. He learned to think for himself. He is not now, you know, along or going along with, the, with, 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 with what the government is telling us about there are certain people who don't like us. I remember in the First World War, turn of the 19th century, they was telling us that the Chinese people was against us. There was the people that was walking around with hatches that would take our life at night. And that whole scare tactics to keep us divided and conquered so we couldn't come together in harmony and peace. It is the same method that is being used today. But I did not come here to just badger the police department because some of them are my best friend. I go to some of their houses and we sit in fact, I'm, I've been involved in education, and one of the schools that I was at teaching, there was a police officer there involved with helping the kids and all of that, and him and I became close friends. He liked Weston, so don't I. So there's a group of friends that come by his house, and we watch movies together occasionally. I'm talking about the top brass, the lieutenants, and the, you know, the brass, the ones in the high up. But there is a different manner about them and socialization within that group than there are when we are confronted with them in the street. When we see the police in the street, we see the man with the mask. We see the man, pull over that car. Let me see your driver's license. Let me see your registration. Stone face, as if he was out to do harm towards us. But like I said, in a social gathering, they're not so much that way. So maybe there is hope. Maybe behind that cold mass of exterior, there is a human heart that beat, and, and sometime in the future, maybe they will understand what they are doing to us. Don't seem to be that way tonight. Tonight, all you have to do is be in a certain part of the community. You might be wearing black clothes, because there was a time, and I just want to give you a little peek of my life. One of the first times that I ever got arrested, because I've been arrested more than one time, it was because of the fact that was I was out on the street after 8 o'clock at night. It was called abroad in the night. If you didn't have a special place to go, or if you didn't have a job on the streets, then you could be locked up for being on the street after the sun go down. And I know that that might sound chaotic to you, just as much as it might sound chaotic to you that when I came north in 1959, I had to go to the colored section in the Greyhound bus station in order to get a ticket. It might seem strange to you in 1959 that I had to eat on the side of the station where they were serving food because I couldn't go in the front to get to be served. That was only a short time ago. So I'm saying that these are some of the conditions that we come through and that we've been through. So Ayub and I, and that's what I really want to get to, and that's what I came here for, is the fact that he's a brother that's in our community. We came out tonight for the fundraiser for him. His name is, is Ayub Abdul Alim. He's a brother, he's a friend, he's a, he's a member of our community. 
and he's a pillar of our community. He's been helping us in many ways. He helped establish the prison program where people could go and see their loved ones in the institutions. He also helped to start a food program for those people who without food could eat. He also uh, made arrangements for to have a place that when we wanted to come to pray a masala, we could walk off the street and pray at any hour of the day or night. So he was doing a lot of things in the community. And there were some people who did not like the prestige and the power that he was developing on the corner where his business was. And it was I, myself, that told you, I said, the FBI have came into our place of worship on Friday. And I said, I don't know why they're here, and I don't know who invited them here. But would you please take a picture of them so we'll know that they're here, and the next time we'll be able to be aware of the fact that they're coming here. And I don't know if that was the beginning of them dealing with you, but I know that Menonakis out of Springfield area who was loaned from the police department to the task force of the FBI has been one of the people individually that has been hounding you since that time. And it did not stop until they put him in the lockup. He's waiting to go to trial on the 15th of November. And we will find out the result of what they will do with him and we're praying and hoping that everything will turn out favorably. But the lawyer said that he could be facing 15 years in prison behind a handgun or something they alleged that was on him. So anyway, uh, I just want to conclude with that and uh, have a good evening and I'm so very glad that I was able to share that information with you. Would you tell the man's name? He lived 501, I grew up 501 Wilberham Road. He was loaned from the police department during the time of 9-11 and became a part of the FBI task force who is working with the FBI on loan from the police department presently. We can keep the movement moving, folks. Uh, we'll keep the movement moving. Uh, we have Julia, uh, Ayub's friend, who will say a few words. Then what we're going to um, hope for um, I believe it will be executed. Um, I will give, give us a call and we'll be able to hear his voice, um, which is always something important to have. So Julia, please give a round of applause. Everybody. Hi everybody. Um, I originally came out here tonight to really show my support for um, my brother Ayub. I knew him personally growing up. I grew up in a Muslim household. I was actually um, in foster care at that time. And that's when I actually got to know him personally. But um, one thing I did take from IU and the teaching that he taught me was that the Muslim community actually promotes peace. Like most of their teaching is surrounded by peace. And growing up watching the news, um, I was kind of underneath the stereotype that Muslims were not really from the teachings of peace. The government actually uses war tactics in um, tries to subhumanize the Muslim community by calling them terrorists and making it seem like there's some actual fear that we should have for them. But in actual reality, we should have fear for the government and their intentions <laughs> and why they're doing it. I mean, um, I think about, you know, the people over there, how, you know, they're getting killed and all in the name of basically being scared that they're terrorists. But it's just like, they're really the terrorists. I mean, if you think about it, they can go into your home and place a gun into your hands, what can you do? So it's just, I want to come out, not only just to show my support for IU, but for anybody who's been underneath that type of persecution and felt like they didn't have anybody there for them. So that's why I'm out here tonight. And hopefully everybody can bring that message home and realize this is just far beyond the Muslim community. This is for everybody, mother, sister, brother, anybody that could be in the same predicament as IU right now. Thank you. Well, one of the um, one of the beautiful things I'm noticing, not just about this evening, but um, what's happening in this country is that uh, people are beginning to take stronger stances against police brutality. While we're dealing with something that certainly involves the NSA and what the Obama has, the Obama administration has done to exacerbate um, the tactics of the NSA. Um, one of the most powerful things about cell phone cameras is that we can use them. That's right. All right. We can use them. And I've never seen, I'm not an old man, really, I'm not, as you know, I'm not old. 
<laughs> um, but with this rise in technologies, especially with our cell phones, people are beginning to document this stuff. And it's gone viral. And it gives us um, an evidentiary um, foundation to launch our attack against police brutality. So, so that, that, that's, that's a beautiful thing that we're witnessing right now. And, and secondly, um, we're building on victories. Um, I remember when I first got involved with Justice for Charles, it, it, was, a, it was a small number of us right here. I say, I, say, I say the first night, it was about probably no more than 15 of us. Um, and that, that, made me, that made me pushing it. Pushing it. And, and we were essentially starting from scratch. Charles did all this work while inside the prison. Um, Beer and Ed, they had their research and they were doing work, but I remember it was me and Joe and, and Will when he was here, um, and I'm not sure if uh, anybody else who was here was present, but but we were we were in the living room, and, and I'll be honest, when, when I was in that living room, it just seemed like a lot. It seemed like a lot. We were like, whoa, wait a minute. We're dealing with the criminal justice system, a man who's been convicted of murder, doing life in prison, a possibility of parole. Like, it was just like, whoa, wait a minute now. I, and we just started putting ourselves out there, getting the support, and then we have folks like Lo Lois um, join, uh, the Tartikovs, um, Carly and Gary, um, Students Against Mass Incarceration, especially in Mount Holyoke chapter, which I think gave us a larger platform, um, especially when we had um, Sisters like Rosa Clemente, who'll be speaking to us, um, Mark Lamont Hill, who came. I mean, it just really gave us the opportunity to reach a larger audience. Mm. And with that victory, I think it's going right into this campaign. And we're really building something that we can use to deal with other injustices, not only in Western Massachusetts, but I think we can expand into Massachusetts. Without question, I find that people are really beginning to look at this area. Mm. And not just look at it for some of the corruption, but look at it for some of the victories that are being that are being accomplished. So we certainly deserve to give ourselves a round of applause for a lot of the work we've been doing. I mean, we show, show Mumia's film. Um, that had a great turnout. Uh, Lois and Dr. Chris Tinson and uh, Jam uh, Jamila um, Wilson uh, spoke. It was a great turnout. And I think we're re really beginning to raise the critical consciousness around issues such as mass incarceration, um, the prison industrial complex, political prisoners, and police brutality. So just please give yourselves a round of applause because this thing is, we're still we're really keeping it through. We're really keeping it through. We don't want to, we don't want to undermine what we're doing, not, at least not yet, really. We don't want to undermine what we're doing. We don't want to mitigate or downplay what we're doing. A lot of people are doing some great work. There are plenty of organizations you can link up with right now. Um, we're waiting for Brother Ayub to call. Um, so what I'm going to do right now, because I don't like being loquacious, is uh, is call anyone up who has any word, who, have, who may have words, who may want to just offer their thoughts on this day, whether it's for Brother Ayub, whether it's for um, just raising awareness or, or around police brutality, the prison industrial complex, any word. Maybe we could pass them out so that people could get them. Um, what's happening right now, uh, the Massachusetts Department of Corrections is about to start a new policy where um, if you're a visitor, not in a jail, but in a, a prison, um, you there will be dogs, um, not in the waiting room, but like in the security trap where you get searched, like between the, the waiting room, security trap, visiting room, right? So in that place where you're being searched, is where um, there'll be dogs w with the guards, mm. and supposedly they're searching for drugs. And this is a new policy. It hasn't started yet. And there is, I, I have initiated a campaign around the state um, to try to stop this. And um, in the last few weeks, there's been a lot of progress. Um, there are now a couple of uh, law firms that are gonna sue the DOC. Department of Corrections, once they begin. Um, there are big organizations like the ACLU signing on to the campaign. So things are moving forward. Um, and 
I don't know if it's possible for it to us to stop it, but it's definitely possible to slow them down. Once we have a suit, there'll be a temporary injunction. They'll have to stop it. They'll have to hold a hearing, the Department of Corrections, on why they're doing this. Um, that higher ups in the Department of Corrections have um, called people up that they consider stakeholders to try to tell them this basically this line of bullshit about why it is that um, they're putting dogs to sniff people. Really what everybody knows is is that drugs and other contraband, the, me the vast, vast, vast majority of it comes in with guards. <laughs> That's who brings it in. That's who sells it. That's who doesn't get searched. That's how it gets in. Not just drugs, but telephones, food, all this kind of stuff that's flooded in the prisons is not being sewn into the hem of somebody's skirt. <laughs> and so um, I hope that everybody takes those flyers. And there are three calls, one to the governor, one to the head of the Department of Corrections, and one to the head of the Executive Office of Public Safety, the person who's in charge of the whole rigmarole, Andrew Cabral. It will take you three minutes to make the calls. And so I really, 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 I need to, I, we need to push back, and we are pushing back, and it's something that you can do, and I encourage you to do it. I just also wanted to say to uh, lead off from uh, Dr. Ishmael Lee, one thing about IU, uh, a young African-American, Latino young man who's an entrepreneur, being positive in the community, he had a, a tremendous impact on, on young people. He was very positive, always uplifting, and, and never, never negative. Um, these charges that are trumped up against him, imagine your synagogue, your church, your fraternity, your campus, your uh, social organizations, your Facebook page, your Twitter account, is spied on. And what was so heinous and so evil about this situation with Ayub was that he was pressured into spying on the Muslim community in West Springfield and in the city of Springfield and all of Western Massachusetts. And he consistently refused. And that is so uh, diabolic and mean spirit and really un American. So I just wanted to tell you, all of you that we would be on your side if this happened to you. Thank you. Renzo Gaines, and I actually was locked up with IU in uh, Hampton County House of Correction, and I helped him draft a two-page letter really laying out the details of his case. And I feel very honored and privileged to be here tonight, and I want to thank you for hosting an event like this because a lot of people don't really understand what it's like to be behind the wall. Mm -hmm. So I probably spent about 70 days uh, incarcerated. Uh, I was charged with burning down my house on Christmas Eve in Springfield, Massachusetts, which I uh, didn't do. Uh, and I, before this, I used to be in the community. I ran for public office on three occasions. I ran for city council and state representative in the city of Springfield. And I worked with young people all my life. Uh, I'm a protege of Art Sirota and the Learning Tree, a former lawyer who helped black and Latino men get their education and go on to teaching and stuff. I uh, was in the James Baldwin Scholars Program at Hampshire College as one of the first JBs. And I stand before you today really proud and honored that folks really are listening to people like Ayub and like myself uh, because I too am fighting for myself uh, to vindicate my name and to get back to my community and to my family. But the important thing that I wanted to share about Ayub is in the time that I spent behind the wall, he was one of the first people that came up to me and really made me feel safe and comfortable. And as we got to know each other, he uh, shared the details of his case. And I was able to, based on my own experience working for a law firm, or formerly Robinson, Donovan, Madden, and Barry, was able to leverage some of my experiences and help him kind of 
create a timeline for his course of action and advocacy. So that's kind of even how all of this started. I'm not taking any credit. I'm just saying that I use my time wisely and I benefited from my relationship with him and, and knowing him helped me actually get out and become not incarcerated, at least at the moment. So Ayub is a, is a really special person. I met him, uh, again, as my travels in Springfield, running for office uh, at the Nature's Garden uh, store where he was selling incense and really promoting community, where he took a dilapidated property in the, in the middle of the Mason Square, and he revitalized it where he had the community center, and he provided uh, clean and comfortable housing for many people in the community. And so when I got behind the wall, you know, I hadn't seen him for a while, so I was surprised, number one, to see an individual like that. And he explained to me a situation, and as we spent time on A4, um, I got to read some of the affidavits and some of the details that you see in the letter uh, would certainly raise questions and red flags to any reasonable individual. And so some of the things that aren't in the letter is their interaction with him and uh, I think it's Officer Sheehan, where he says that uh, he, the, Ayub was going into Walmart and he did some karate moves and went for his gun, which is not true. So that's the premise that when they did arrest him on December 11th that he used, that he's a known uh, person of interest in the community that did this particular act. Well, we all know that in, in Springfield, or most communities, if you reach for an officer's gun, they're probably going to beat you half to death and or shoot you on the spot with or without justification. So when I read that in the affidavit, because they have to justify why, they have to create probable cause as to why they stopped him, which even with that, that's not probable cause under that night. Uh, so I was definitely uh, very, my interest was piqued. Uh, I read further about the case and, and the night in question, and uh, his lawyer, um, I believe uh, Thomas Robinson, had went and provided um, someone to take pictures from where the undercover was sitting to where they allegedly saw him and this other person of interest. And you can clearly see from the pictures, which I saw firsthand, that it's impossible to make out some of the details that they allege in this particular affidavit. It's just, it's impossible. Um, there were other things that um, he shared with me that, you know, really, um, again, made me become an advocate for him and certainly a supporter. Um, you know, just, um, he sh there was a, an attorney, uh, John Thompson, who gave him these, these, uh, the, pro the protocol for getting tarot tapes. So tarot tapes are the tapes that are used for the transmission between the dispatch and the officers in the field. And so you'll see in the letter where it talks about um, the officer had called and asked for him to be searched and how one officer said that he was cleared, he had no weapons. And then there was a private phone call between the officers on their cell phone, which is again standard operating procedure. If this was police business, then all of the information and all the conversation should have been on the walkie-talkie and the terror tapes, not individual cell phones. So it certainly would raise a red flag to me if I was a citizen. I would certainly feel that my rights were violated and that something unscrupulous was going on. Um, furthermore, you know, as he's been incarcerated, he shared with me that an FBI person did come to, a, to visit him previously to that night. But on that particular night, when they arrested him and put him in the car, or they were interrogating him at the police station, the officer comes in the room and said to him, is he ready to make the deal of his life? Mm -hmm. And offered him uh, a deal to be a, 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 an informant, which he you know, staunchly refused. And you know, so when you, you talk about these things and he shares with you with, in, with you in detail the, the documentation, which I, again, he probably can't share with the general public because it would compromise his uh, defense and his integrity of his defense when, he goes, when and if he goes to trial. But I was able to see a lot of these things firsthand. And I was able to see how committed he is and even some of the case law, like you know, 51A is when you, well no, it's not that, but illegal search and seizure means that if you were illegally stopped and frisked, without probable cause or you were profiled, they can't use the fruits of that search to incarcerate you. And, you know, based on what he's told me and kind of what I read my own self, you know, they really had no probable cause to stop him and or arrest him. And uh, I just, again, want to just say that, you know, I can't wait to hear his voice. I spent a lot of time in, in close consultation with him. I've broke bread with him behind the wall. I've prayed with him behind the wall. And I'm glad to see a lot of people coming out to support him. 
Uh, I heard him talk on the Respect for Life uh, show maybe a couple weeks ago, and really would love to hear his voice and to see how he's doing and other people are doing uh, at the Hampton County House of Correction. Because not only is his situation, or most people's situation behind the wall, uh, very difficult to advocate and fight for yourself, and I'll just say this because when I was behind the wall, you couldn't even make phone calls. And so making a phone call is a new thing for IU. Uh, when I was there, they had changed over the phone system and they just made it extremely difficult for you to meet with your lawyer, to go to the law library. You're supposed to have access to go to the law library as many times and as often as you like. Uh, they only let you go to the law library about once a week for about an hour, which is against the DOC uh, rules. Um, uh, the food is terrible, the ventilation is terrible, there are a lot of sick people and infirm people that you're in general population whether they have hepatitis A, B, or C. Uh, there are people that have tuberculosis. Um, there are some serious, serious violations that are going on here in, in the Hamden County House of Correction that not only compromise uh, your mental well-being, but it really compromises your ability to fight. You know, being isolated, when I was with IU, IU hadn't had a visit in about 18 months. And he really has very limited support, I mean, up until this point that I know of. And I got out April 5th of this year. Uh, he's had very little support and um, has very little money in terms of on his commissary stuff. But he is a resilient individual. He's very creative. He's very personable. And um, I just, you know, again, I, I want to thank you on behalf of him and other people who are incarcerated and applaud young people at Mount Holyoke for the uh, resistance to mass incarceration. It is a pr prison industry complex. You can really talk about the inequalities that individuals face behind the wall, whether they're being written up for, for bogus infractions. Um, you know, one of the things that really stands out to me that I was fighting for while I was there is um, they make the individuals eat in their cell. And if you've ever been in jail, your cell is about this wide and you know your bed is about yay long and in front of your bed or next to it just by a few feet are, is your toilet. So they serve you your food and then lock you back up to eat your food next to your toilet, which is just, it's unsanitary, number one, but psychologically it prevents you from having that social time and communicating. And um, they also, the rec time is just really, it's just, it's inadequate to be quite frank with you. And so a lot of, a lot of people, if they don't have mental illness or they do have mental illness, it becomes exacerbated by being behind the wall and by being isolated and keeping these fluorescent lights on 24 hours a day and, you know, doing random checks and stuff like that. And I just know that he's gone through hell. And he is a resilient individual, and I just know that he appreciates this support. And again, you know, at 830, I can't wait to hear his voice and just maybe be able to ask him a question or two and just see how he's doing because, you know, I know that when he sees you in the courtroom in November, and I'll certainly do all that I can to be there, it's going to lively his spirits. It's going to make him continue to fight this fight because... He is a, a very bright individual, and he has done a lot on his own, and just this will keep moving the momentum forward. And I just want to say that he is not the only person that is wrongly incarcerated in Hampton County House of Correction or in Massachusetts. And people really need to be bringing attention to um, the officers and the investigators that do these faulty investigations that wrongfully incarcerate people and just put their lives in a tailspin. You know, if you do know IU, uh, he had a store, he had a house, he had a family, he was a positive member in the community, and he's really lost all of that, to be quite frank with you. And I've had these conversations with him. And, um, you know, he's distraught, but, you know, one thing to his credit is he's a very strong individual and this support will go a long way. So I just wanted to share that with you. Again, I know firsthand uh, how, how wonderful he is and how welcoming and inviting he was to me and how knowledgeable is he is, he is and has become over the law. So, uh, again, you know, keep up the fight and free are you. For Ayu Khan, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. That was a very important word. Um, while we're waiting for Ayu, I'm going to bring up um, a very close person to me, uh, Sister Rosa Clemente. If some of y'all don't know who she is, you need to go on the internet, check her out. But of course, one of the biggest things that stands on her long resume, um, 2008 vice presidential candidate for the Green Party, along with Cynthia McKinney, the only, the only presidential ticket featuring two women of color history of this country so she, she does so much and of course a 
soon as he can call in, I'll just shut up. Um, um, thank you so much for sharing your story, right? Because I think it's uh, the everyday little things that we probably couldn't even deal with as free people. You know, I often hate when people are like, oh, we're all enslaved. It's like, no, actually, we're not, you know. Um, because that idea of um, losing your physical freedom is something that most of us can't imagine. Um, you know, and many of us who've done either civil disobedience or direct action, like after one day in lockup, you're fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse the language too much. Uh, my Muslim <laughs> brothers and sisters right now, and people who don't curse, but um, I'll try not to curse after that one. Um, so I, I don't think I could really say much that hasn't been said about why we all disdain mass incarceration and um, this continuing system of mass incarceration, even as we win victories, you know? So I've been doing this work now with the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement since 1996. Um, and actually was, um, watched the trial of Amadou Diallo. I was actually living in Albany, New York. Um, mm -hmm. Amadou Diallo was February 1999. And why this is historically important, I remember, um, is that it is in 1998 that this day actually comes about. And one of the people who created this day was Richie Perez, a former Young Lord Party member of New York who had been doing a lot of work around police brutality, but found a new way to do the work, which is to get the families involved. And as you see now, a lot of work around police, or all work around police brutality, or police murders, or executions. If you don't have the family involved, you're really not doing the grassroots work, right? Like, and, and for a lot of these families, it is the first time that they don't like the police which I find always very fascinating. So New York City at that time, when Amadou Diallo was murdered in front of his house, 41 bullets in the Bronx on Westchester Avenue, um, the year before, there had been a, a young man by the name of um, Anthony Bias that had been murdered by the New York Police Department. Right, so oftentimes we only hear about what's happening in New York, and that's how I kind of get involved. I'm from the Bronx. My father, my father heard those 41 shots. He was at work. He owns a building two blocks from where Amadou Diallo was shot. You know, it happened to be like a, a touch, uh, kind of one of those moments that was pushing young people who were beginning, particularly in California, to do work around mass incarceration. So between 1996 and 2000, you have not only hip hop culture pushing the, this idea of what is happening with police. The police are bad. Um, it doesn't matter if they're black. We don't like any of them. Not only do you have that, you also have Mumia. You have Asada's first bounty. You have the start of critical resistance. You have a new wave of young people understanding the plight of political prisoners and prisoners of war that have been incarcerated since the 60s and 70s, but kind of have been forgotten about for 15 or 20 years by what we could consider the masses of our community, right? So this is a very exciting time. And then 911 happened, right? And you quickly saw not only the clamp down on activism, right, but what was beginning to happen to Muslim brothers and sisters, especially living in New York and the terror that we're facing. And I remember that um, one night, 27 offices in New York City were broken into, <coughs> like Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, um, um, Coalition for Asian Americans, Police Against Brutality, like all the, you know, all it, like all computers were stolen and all this, and one of the elders, Lynn Stewart, <laughs> who was free at the time, told us, get ready for another 20 years of COINTELPRO. Mm -hmm. And she's like, and it's not gonna be the COINTELPRO of, assassinations is going to be what I, she didn't use the word microaggression but what she said is it's going to be little things that start to build and build to the point where we won't have really any clear idea of who is doing kind of surveillance work in our communities again right um, and this is where we're at now 10 years later like an entire decade of not only mass surveillance but militarized police right and we have an entire generation, another generation about to be locked down. 
And the difference this time is that it's going to be more women because it is African-American, Latina women that are now the growing number in the prison industrial complex, right? And then we win these victories or we get prisons shut down or we get prisons not built. And then you know what? Then they built immigrant detention. And that's the new wave of detention. And mass incarceration is immigrant detention. And that's where more money is going to, right? So then it seems overwhelming and then we have the individual stories, you know? So then what is it the work that we're supposed to be doing? I think what has happened in the last four years, or let's say six years of having a black president particularly has put a crimp in how we move and the things we say and the truth we speak and the new innovative ideas that we need. Unfortunately, our movement it's not much, it's not a, it, it was being co-opted, but this movement has become marginalized because we are afraid to do things that are new and things that are necessary. Do y'all feel me on this? Yeah, we understand. Because like, yeah. that's where, and part of it is that we do have to have some type of regrouping. Like, where, who are our allies for real? What, what, is, what is our vision? What is the solidarity do, that, do, that we need? Why is it that we don't talk about white supremacy every single time we're talking about this system? You know, what, why is that? Why is it that we're afraid of having even this discourse that is uncomfortable when it is brothers and sisters having to eat food next to the toilet every day? That shit's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So our discourses should be more uncomfortable, right? And oftentimes, so we're we're in a, it's a, it's we're in a very situ we're in an interesting situation, right? And I don't know how we're gonna get out of it, but I do know that a new younger generation of people not only need to step up, they need to be critically supported. And I also believe that we have to really wrap our minds around getting away of this liberal notion that voting is gonna get us out of this situation. Third party or not, voting is not getting us out of mass incarceration, right? And reform is reform. That's not revolution. And a lot of the victories that we're seeing that people are claiming are important, but they're also reformist moves. So what, we reform one, so it's less than or it's better than, but then something else creeps up along, or there's another murder. And that gets me to the current status that we're in. You know, statistically, this is what's happening in America. Every 28 hours, an African-American man, woman, or child is killed by police, mm. by vigilantes, or by security. Mm. So. Um, as a member of the Malcolm X grassroots movement, this is the curriculum we have, but we also have a report online that includes 313 names of these African-American brothers and sisters who were assassinated, uh, that's the language I use, in a six month period. Mm -hmm. We're currently updating this report for the year to include Latinos, because the killing of Latino young men in California can be just as compared to the killing of majority African American men in NYPD. Like it's it's crazy what's happening in California and Anaheim and all these kind of conservative areas where Latinos have been pushed out of urban environments into these suburb environments, right? And then in there we also did the vigilante, right? Like George Zimmerman, right? And then that gets us to another interesting thing that we should be really thinking about when we do this work in terms of how we talk about race. But it's interesting that what we have now, or well not interesting, I think that's what it's meant to be, that I say we're at this fourth phase of white supremacy, the refinement phase, which no longer needs a white face to put the system forward. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So you have Barack Obama, and then there'll be Hillary Clinton in 2016, who will be known as a feminist, but she's the most anti-feminist, warmongering woman that could probably ever be president. You know, and this idea, this refinement stage, it's gonna be people that look like us, folks of color, that are 
putting the system of white supremacy forward. Maybe not with power or the violence that's needed, but at least with the ideology, the idea, and the look. Right? It's, it's, it's so this is why young people, in a way, are very confused about what's going on. This is why people don't know how to discourse about this. People don't understand. You know, that is people that look like me that could potentially be pushing policies that kill people who look like me. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's, that's, a, that's a very confusing thing, particularly to young people of color in the movement, and many young people of color who support or supported President Obama. Like, if he really wanted to do something, he would just put a federal executive order on, like, right now, anybody who's been mass incarcerated because of d drugs not, is out. Mm. Right? Like, don't tell me that you're going to look into what's happening. We know what's been happening. We've lost two generations about to go on a third. Right? And we understand that right now, who's bearing the brunt of all this kind of counterintelligence, the real militarized violence is not only our brothers and sisters who are being droned, but Muslim communities in, you know, Arab American communities. In this country right now, they're the ones that are suffering the most brunt of the surveillance. We don't know it yet. I mean, we know it. But when the history is written and the files come out and the reports and people start talking, we're going to be ashamed that we didn't step up to stop what's going on in Muslim and Arab American communities all around this country. You know, so it, it, it's just so many things to deal with, but with all that being said, I'm always hopeful. <laughs> you, cannot, you cannot not do this work and be hopeful, because you do have victories. You know, we do have victories. This is why they keep throwing things at us. Every time we have a win, they got to block it. That's, the, that's what the war situation we're in right now. The more we win, the more they oppress. The more we push, the more they push back. You know, but I always believe in the power of the people. And if Herman Wallace could smile after getting out and knowing he was gonna die in two days, if Lynn Stewart could write a card on her birthday to us, telling us, keep moving. If Mumia could be writing books if brothers and sisters can come out and still have a life after an experience of being incarcerated, you know, my husband was formerly incarcerated and he says, one day is one day too many. Mm. It's not always about how much time you spend, it's the fact that you spent time and someone took away your freedom. Not only took away your freedom, tried to take away your dignity, your humanity, right? And what Lois says is so important. You know, this is why I don't, I, I'm straight up, I don't like cops, security, I don't like none of them. <laughs> and the reason why is because most of us in this room have made a choice to do jobs that might not pay us a lot. <laughs> most of us in this room are doing jobs that are about teaching, working in the community, the environment, justice, food justice, um, birthing, doulas, all, all artists, right? If we can make those choices, I don't want to hear about good jobs for cops. I don't want to hear that that's the only choice I have. Now, if you live in a community where that might be the only choice you have, like going there or going to the army, yes. But I'm not trying to hear that from people like us who have privilege to even be in a room tonight to have a conversation like this. Right? We make choices, you can make choices. That's why I don't trust none of them. Because there's people right now behind the walls, 40, Oscar Lopez, 30 years in solitary confinement. For what? For fighting for freedom and not even using a gun, using his words? Leonard Peltier, and I talk about, these are political prisoners, right? I'm talking about the millions of other people that are incarcerated, these particular people, because I often find their stories like, how do you do what you do after you've been locked up 42 years? Like, how is it, like, what kind of resilience or strength does that take? You know? So, I'm just going to just read you a part of this, and um, I'm, I really hope that Brother Ayu will be able to call in. But look, I'm very clear that the state probably knows 
that he was yeah, supposed yes. to call in. Yeah. And we're like, well, too bad for y'all, right? And um, he's very clear right now, as he's not been able to make his phone call of what has happened. So definitely in November, as many people need to show up, because that support is always so critical, and that's what happens. And it happens a lot to sisters behind the walls. I've been to both types of prisons, and what you notice is when you walk in a prison, a women's correctional facility, there's nobody there visiting the women. Men, lie, you know, you gotta wait hours. It's usually pretty packed. But it's also, right, people know that people get lost in that system if they don't have support. And that's when the state or the CEOs could do whatever they want to those people. And there's a lot of those across the board. So there was a young brother by the name of Kamani Gray that was shot. So again, being from New York, this is like all the time. Every day. Every day. Yeah, I mean, the big, Amadou Diallo, Sean Bell, Patrick Dorisman, um, Marley Graham, Kamani Gray, like, has, I've been to so many f rallies, like, this, when is the this gonna stop? What is the response that? That, that is needed. And what I realized in being part of the Malcolm X grassroots movement when we wrote this report is that it's every 28 hours, almost every day. And remember, these are stories that we could find. What about the stories we can't find? Mm -hmm. And right now, as um, me and Iman are in our doctoral studies in the Du Bois Department up at UMass, one thing I'm learning, um, we're both uh, TA for Professor Ernie Allen, his um, African American Civil Rights class, and this, you know, lynchings and these things that were happening. But the rural stories of black people, you know, how many people were killed, and we will never know. Mm -hmm. We will just never know those numbers. So I, I told Kali Akuno, who really is, I think, one of the best kind of minds and leaders around this movement, around police brutality, mass incarceration. I was like, this is like probably every 14 hours. Mm -hmm. Wait till we get some more numbers and so on. And, and what does that say for a people who can't protect their young? You know, um, a lot of these were young brothers and sisters, although there's people that are 72 years old that have been here as well. Mm -hmm. They don't care, you know, and that's one thing we're learning a lot in this class that, as Dr. Allen said, unless you were, had only one leg in a wheelchair and were like 95 years old, you were a threat. Mm -hmm. So um, this story you can find on ebony.com. I just wanted to read you what I think it means to at least begin to uh, assert leadership outside of the leadership that's thrust upon us. I tell young people, always be worried about somebody who says that's your leader. <laughs> <laughs> if you study the 60, like why are you my leader? Who made you? Like why do you have a TV show? I don't know, the reason. <laughs> I don't think it is to free black people. <laughs> why do you keep getting award? You know, I, was, I tell young people, and I, I like the way young people organize around decentralized leadership. Now, you always have to have leadership in the organization, but it could be more shared. But the idea of one particularly male leader that speaks for all of us is, it is so problematic, especially when young people want to rise up, and then they're told this is not the time. So it's like, when is the time? When they get shot? Like when every, somebody's getting shot every hour? Like when is the time for young people to do what they got to do? You know, and I often tell young people, do what you have to do. Like, be prepared, but do what you have to do to push this. Because right now we're stuck and we need new tactics. So, um, I'll just read this part. Last year, the Malcolm X grassroots movement released every 36 hours a report that documented the extrajudicial killing of the United States in the first six months of 2012. When the next version is released, Kamani Gray's name will be added to the list of people killed for seemingly no reason but being black in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm. Flatbush, Brooklyn is a predominantly Caribbean community and it is no stranger to police harassment and brutality. As I lived there for five years, the tactics I learned in the Malcolm X grassroots movement, particularly Cop Watch, which utilizes video recording, 
to videotape the police as well as inform the community as we're videotaping the police. This neighborhood reflected on the loss of another promising young person. His principal said we believed in his potential from day one. He traveled for over an hour each day from East Flatbush to Midtown West in Manhattan. The year and a half we had Kamani allowed us to know his best self. Day after day, our political leaders remind us of human rights violations happening all across the world. Yet they often fail to recognize and stand up against the violation that is happening in their own backyards. In communities of color, young men and women feel under siege. Kamani's murder and the resistance displayed by these young people those four days that the media called race riots, while many of us call rebellions, by young, must be taken as a continual call to action. We must not condemn young people. We must ask ourselves as older people, why have we allowed this to happen? Why have we not protected our young people? Where have we failed in organizing a long-term movement that does not base its goals on legislative reform or poli elected political leaders? Omawali Adewali, a father and community organizer from Brooklyn, has the, a radical solution. The only negotiation I want conducted on my behalf with the police is withdraw of their paramilitary troops from my community, which includes community affairs, helicopters, police horses, barricades, and your stations. He says, likening the need for police to turn over control of our communities to that of the supposed U.S. military's efforts and withdrawing from Iraq. His words echo the sentiment running through Flatbush in this traumatic movement. But his words also echo a transnational sentiment. Wherever young people of color are, wherever they are, whether they are in Palestine or New Zealand or Spain or Greece, or Flatbush, Brooklyn, or on a BART train going home on New Year's Eve. Their bodies are always subjected to white supremacist violence. The truth is that the police murder black and Latino people because they know they can. They know that they will be believed and supported by their superiors, that their right to menace our communities will be defended to the nail. When young people realize this, can we be surprised by their choice to rebel? As you can see from these pictures, the youth in Brooklyn have hit the streets to let the police know just how they feel. You might not like it, but you won't turn away from it. Unsurprisingly, a number of them have been subjected themselves now to brutality as an arrest, as a result. And instead of arresting the three officers that murdered Kamani Gray, seven of his family members have been detained for so-called rioting. In the wake of Kamani's killing, Vicente Albana, Alba Panama, longtime community organizer and Young Lords Party member, stated, murder and violence by law enforcement is a nationwide international epidemic with historical roots in the genocide of the indigenous, the enslavement of Africans, and the exploitation of poor and working folk. The only way to end this is to make revolution. How many Kamanis must there be before we actually make that happen? Mm. So um, it's a lengthier article, but I just wanted to put that out there as a hope. That's what we, we got to keep fighting and we keep pushing. And, you know, so I'm always grateful to be, like, within uh, community as we are not academics that stay in the ivory tower <coughs> or mm -hmm. ebony tower or beige tower. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm always grateful to be here at Food for Thought. So, um, again, we know why the brother probably didn't get through. Um, so try to support him. Um, try to support political prisoners and prisoners of war by writing them. You'd be surprised. They all write back, and they're going to tell you exactly what you need to be doing. And it's always great to get a letter from behind the wall for a brother and sister who's literally mostly on solitary confinement at this point or are sick and dying, like Lynn Stewart is our next one. She's made it clear. She's pretty close to where Herman was. You know, and, and if we could get Lynn out to spend a week. But you know, again, to see Herman release with that smile on his face, but to know, it, was, it reminded me of when Troy Davis, when we were all here and we all went home that night, right? And then it was like 11.30 and they executed him basically behind our backs and so many people felt so devastated. You know, and then his sister keeps fighting till her death. And that's what freedom is, right? It's lifelong struggle. 
It's not a trend, it's not a fashion show, it's not a rap song, it's not a book, it's not what you can theoretically spit out, it's how you live your everyday life. So thank you for having me and, and justice for IU and all our brothers and sisters behind the walls. We're going to pass it on. Um, we have a few more minutes left. Um, we're going to pass it on to Lenny Jackson. Uh, we have we get, everybody sit tight. Remember, we're in this for the long haul. Y'all yeah, get y'all sleep in a few. We give it up for Lenny, all right? <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Lynn Jackson. I'm from Albany, New York. And I must say, uh, it's uh, quite an act to follow. So I'll be very brief. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosa. That was absolutely beautiful. Um, uh, I'm with Project Salam, which is uh, uh, support and legal advocacy for Muslims. And this is an organization that we began in Albany, New York, because we had a case similar to Ayub's case that happened in Albany. Um, that case was the case of Yassin Araf and Mohammed Hussein. Yassin Araf was a, a Kurdish imam that the FBI targeted. And uh, Mohammed Hussein was a pizza shop owner, and he was considered a uh, collateral damage in this particular case. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details of the case, uh, but what I think is important to remember is what the prosecution said at their uh, post-sentencing press conference. Because what happened, um, in, in the end, the, the FBI likes to crow about their wins. And um, there was a tremendous amount of community uh, support for Yassin Araf and Mohammed Hussein. And the FBI felt they had to, you know, justify why they sentenced these two men, who between them had 10 children, to 15 years in prison. So at the press conference, oh, by the way, Yassin Araf and Mohammed Hussein were convicted of what is called material support for terrorism. Mm -hmm. This is something that the government uses to entrap Muslims. There was an informant in the case. And basically, these two men were entrapped for supposedly uh, laundering money. Um, at the press conference, a reporter asked the government if it believed that Yassin Araf was actually a terrorist. So the prosecutor made re this response. Did he actually himself engage in terrorist acts? We, we didn't have the evidence of that. But he had the ideology. Our investigation was concerned with what he was going to do here in order to preempt anything else. We decided to take the steps that we did. Mm -hmm. So basically, the FBI was admitting that the reason they had entrapped Yassin Araf and Mohammed Hussein was because they thought, they thought these men might think terrorist thoughts, <laughs> which is clearly the thought police. So what is preemptive prosecution? Now, I, I brought my display, our display here. These are about 150 people that we consider are preemptively uh, prosecuted, are political prisoners. And also, we have photographs of many of the men who are in prison uh, lined up along the, the wall there. Uh, many of these men have been in prison for many, many years in particularly horrible conditions. Uh, some people were given life, life sentences. Lynn Stewart, of course, is up there because she is one of the, um, she's really in prison now because she sent out, she vigorously defended her Muslim clients. Um, so what the FBI does, just to be very brief, is that uh, they, they use a couple of different methods to entrap Muslims. But uh, Muslims are clearly one of the targeted groups are, of course, uh, we've heard the history of targeted groups this evening, uh, but the FBI is particularly um, targeting Muslims at this point. Um, they use uh, informants to send informants into communities, and they um, use what is called material support laws. So, like for example, there were some women in the Midwest who um, gave used clothes and a few thousand dollars uh, to people in Somalia, and um, they were given these incredible prison sentences of many decades because that was considered material support for terrorism. And this is the kind of thing that's going on. In Ayub's case, I know very little about his case. I'm very happy to hear more about his case this evening. But it appears that the FBI wanted him to be an informant. And this is, of course, what the FBI will do uh, to uh, Muslim men, is try to talk them into being informants. Um, so uh, 
What we have done at Project Salam is we thought in Albany that Yasin Araf and Mohammed Hussein's case was just an anomaly, that all we'd have to do is explain to the government that, that they were wrong about this case and that we, you know, would convince them and Yasin would be freed and Mohammed would be freed. But then um, that, of course, was not the case. They lost their appeals. Um, and we began to meet the families of other people who were imprisoned, and that's why we came up with this wall. And we also online have a database of about 800 men in prison. Oh, and by the way, the Muslims <clears throat> in this country that are targeted in this way are often sent to special Muslim prisons called the communications management units. Has anyone heard of those? Communications management units? And those are special Muslim prisons in, uh, there's one in Terre Haute, Indiana, there's one in Marion, Illinois. They are particularly restrictive. Yassin was sent to the one in Terre Haute and he also spent time in the one in Marion. They are a thousand miles from home. Uh, it, the family couldn't come and visit him. He had very, uh, he wasn't really allowed to call people. It's a very, very restrictive prison. The other prison that they often send Muslims to is the ADX Colorado in Florence, Colorado. And that is a 23 hour day lockdown, solitary confinement prison. So, um, what I just wanted to end with uh, you can find out more about Project Salam if you go to www.projectsalam.org. And we're also affiliated with the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms, which is a national coalition of groups that are looking at the issue of targeting of Muslims. And I'd like to uh, point out my friend and colleague, Sharmeen Siddiqui, who is here with her camera. And um, she works with the National Coalition and came from Boston today to be with us. Um, so uh, it is late, and I, I don't want to take up too much more time. If you want to know more about Project Salon, please um, ask me. The one thing that I'm really happy about is that um, this is a really long fight. This, this is a really uh, long fight, and I'm so happy that there are so many people here who care about IU. And I hope that, I am hoping very much, because of all the people and all the support here, that he will be, he will prevail in his in his case. It's pretty hard. Uh, Muslim cases are pretty hard. The, a lot of the men are sentenced for very long periods of time. But I have great <coughs> hopes because there's so much community support for Ayub here. So my hope is that um, you know, I and I'm also happy to work with people. If there's anything I could do to help, you know, let me know. Um, I just want to read a poem uh, from Yasin Araf, the Imam who's um, who's been imprisoned. Um, he's now in, um, in Pennsylvania. He got out of the communications management unit because he, I think he was released from the communications management unit into a low security prison because he sued the Bureau of Prisons over the communications management unit. And um, I hope he prevails in that case. So I think that's why he's no longer in the, the tremendously uh, difficult lockdown situation. But this is what Yasin wrote. Soul, as they say, when someone dies, you must open a window to allow his soul to get out and fly back to the sky. I'm wondering if I die in this prison cell where there is no window, what will happen to my soul? How will it fly? Where will it go? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All right, y'all, we bring it to an end. We got ended right, my man. Shells coming up on the microphone. Started with culture, we're going to end it with culture. So please, please, please give Shells a round of applause. Bring those own Shells. Just a reminder, I know you, some people have gotten these little things um, throughout the weeks. Um, these pieces of paper are very important. They have October 22nd on it for Food for Thoughts event, but as well as on the back, what I use face. November 15th, uh, 9 a.m. at the third floor, room one, we're gonna be having, um, you know, the court date for IU. So if you can come out and show your support, you guys came here, it would be even greater if you can actually come and see IU personally. Well, not like, you know, get to shake his hand or anything, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Um, uh, I worked with Justice for Charles with Vera Cage and we put out a CD called Mass Incarceration LP and we touched on many things that happened in Massachusetts between the three strikes, um, the, um, Justice for Charles, um, police brutality with Melvin Jones III, as well as the prison to uh, the school to prison pipeline, the prison industrial complex. And that became very successful and um, um, being with the uh, 
Justice for You um, um, campaign, um, I'm gonna you know put out another um, LP, and it's going to be uh, called uh, Al Azab, which is the Allies. It's um, a surah for the Quran, and um, Al Azab, which means the Allies for Ayu. So Al Azab Ayu, and what's really significant, Ayu's name in itself, in in Muslim culture, it translates to Job. So basically, Job from the Bible. And the sto if you know the story of Job, it actually <laughs> teaches us about patience and knowing that God, even though you test and, and, and you know, be, be, be able to endure. So um, with that, I, I, I really looked at a lot of things that were happening between Ayub and tied it into the Muslim culture. And um, you know, I put a little, a couple prayers in there. Um, we're gonna have prayers for Brother Ali. Um, I got some voice clips from the interview from um, Brother um, Ali, who is um, Ayub's biological brother. And that's gonna also be in the clips and everything. And also, um, even though it's not fully rehearsed, I have some tracks that I just show you guys that I've been doing some progress on the tracks. Yes. Yeah, so I have some technical difficulties. Um, And um, just again, um, just I'm gonna be reading out of my phone. It feels very weird for me, but um, yeah. Uh -oh. Okay, bring that back. <laughs> all, all of this is um, locally, locally made um, music um, producers from Springfield, and as well as the artwork and everything around it. So everything is pretty much local. Um, yeah. So whenever you you ready, you got it. I gotta come help you. Yeah, there we go. Can, I, can you turn up just a little bit? Are people really alright? I don't know. Now maybe that's the rapper in me, but like, but um, yeah, this is just um, uh, pretty much uh, how it breaks down. Imagine being there for your community, uplifting the people, children with unity, doing so well, you open up shop. Nature's garden variety, give it all you got. Reaching success with that pivotal power. Understand right here, this is your hour, free are you. Becoming well known and you're Muslim, they ain't all bad. The people are wondering, soon the FBI gets a whiff of his name. So they call him up and ask to take part of the game. Spy on my people, this is insane. Hung up the phone and went back to his family, man. We are you. So you see how it was progressing, how it progressing. Yeah. All of a sudden, after a few weeks, passing the gas station, the cops he sees, thinking of and of it, he walks on by, they stop him for a search, he doesn't comply, they find nothing, oh, what a surprise, until they strip search illegally outside, and man, oh my, so, you see how it's going. So a gun and ammo is what they find without a license. Ayub is doing some time unless he agrees to be an informant. He said it ain't fine, what more do you want? And I will never choose to give in to options you've chosen. From a law, my words are spoken. Yeah. We are you. We are you. We are you. Thank you, Mr. Reverdy. Go ahead, you let, let it play, don't worry. This is uh, the continuation of it. It's actually like two tracks that I kind of blended into one. So um, this one is called My Time. It all blends together, innocence slash my time. And this is more I tried to understand where he came from. They trying to shut me down, they trying to shut me up They always trace my calls, but it's the same old stuff The same story since day one on the radio station They hate un, put them in the hole Use expression of the tongue, they want to strip my lungs Like my body being searched twice They pull my pants down, hocus pocus, gun and ammo Fifteen all my life, but that won't suffice Cause if I ever, ever mention the FBI Keyword, they don't have my wife testify Or she faces Deportation, cause I said no to spying on my own nation. No justification, just us. Inshallah, there'll be just us. Instead, it's just ice for my wife and the case on my life. But I know between wrong and right, and tweet my surprise and pray five times a day. As long as the God don't get in the way, hopefully, God will always be in the way. Shed the light tonight, and I'll be okay. During my time, I got the city on my back, like the rappers always claim. I 
Ayub on the lap, it's time to bring change. It's my time, my time, my time. Hopefully, it all rewinds. So we were just about done. Uh, if anybody wants to have anything to say before we close, you may certainly do that. Other than that, let's give a round of applause to the organizers first. This event. The organizers, supporters, the activists, the freedom fighters for justice for Ayub. Give them a round of applause. So, uh, let's give a round of applause to uh, Food for Thought. Uh, for opening this space for us. Yes. Give them a round of applause. And let's keep building, keep fighting the good fight. Y'all have a good night, everyone.